Um, good to have you here tonight as we uh, come together for this candid conversation. Um, I called it responding to the rainbow, but we'll, um, Brian was all set to explain how a rainbow forms through the prism of light, but then I told him, no, that's not what we're talking about tonight. So, um, Watson. <laughs> Watson, Watson was working on that one. Um, but uh, we're glad you're here. Um, our guest, uh, Pastor Brian and I, you all know, but this is Pastor Jared Bangs, of, uh, uh, the senior pastor of uh, First Baptist Church in Cook, Minnesota. Uh, he's been, you'll be here a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, and did a Saturday morning chat on some of these issues. I, I don't know. Saturday morning, Sunday evening? Is that what it was? Yeah, okay. Well, whatever. Here he is. <laughs> oh, it might have been, yes. Uh, with COVID, we've gotten very confused on how long ago things were. But if it was pre-COVID. Um, but anyway, let's uh, pray and we'll get going here with our candid conversation. Uh, thank you, Father, for tonight and the um, opportunity we have to come together, to think together, to discuss together, and uh, pray that you will lead us into truth, Father, that you will give us wisdom, understanding. Thank you for how, through your word and your spirit, you do lead us, and uh, pray as we live in these very challenging times that you will help us to, uh, again, uh, be faithful to you, honor you. And uh, ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Uh, all the different things we're, we're talking about, how in the world do we even begin? And the question that I came up with is simply this. So, uh, Brian, Jared, imagine that you wake up in the morning uh, a few weeks ago, you step outside the door, and your neighbor has this rainbow pride flag hanging by uh, the front door, his or her front door. Um, and the question is, how do you respond to that? Take a shotgun and shoot the flag? Um, decide I'm never talking to that person again? Or do you decide, decide, well, I'm just going to pretend it's not there. I'll just have the normal relationship with that person, and I, I'll just ignore uh, that that's going on. What, uh, what come, or there's probably some other answers, some, some better answers. And um, what would you say to that, Mr. Bangs? This is not a debate, but um, we'll try to make it one. Me. I thought a lot about that because I actually haven't had a circumstance like that, though I do have one of my siblings would be considered like an, an activist leftist or activist progressive and w would include all the sexual ideology of the LGBT movement. Um, and we don't actively debate, partly because we know where each other stands. I, she needs to come to know Jesus before she you know, before I win her over with certain other ideas. But um, my first thought was, well, it depends on how, it depends on my relationship with that neighbor. That would definitely affect the approach I took. And so I got to thinking, well, what types of categories of neighbor uh, and status of that neighbor would dictate how I would respond? And I thought, well, and this could be any number of things, if it's someone who I didn't know very well, I probably wouldn't lead with, I see you've got a rainbow flag, you and I are at fundamental odds, we probably shouldn't be friends. I, I wouldn't lead with that. I might not, would, would not, not lead with that. Um, if it's a neighbor that was professing to be a Christian, or I knew went to such and such a church, or had, um, you know, had some sort of faith background, that would be one category of neighbor, someone who professes to be Christian and yet is 
openly, outwardly affirming of the LGBT movement. So that w that's one category. The other category would be someone who um, I know to also be a professing Christian and yet has never really seemed to be an activist on anything, but all of a sudden this was something new to them. They're maybe not a progressive Christian or, you know, don't maybe go to an ELCA church or something like that, but they, for whatever reason this year, thought a rainbow flag was a good idea, and then that would be a different category. Then there would be someone who I don't know very well, but I know they're a non-Christian, but they've always been pretty genuine and, and open to dialogue. That would be another category. And then the fourth category I thought would be someone who is oppositional to Christianity in every way and is kind of openly and outwardly antagonistic to the Christian faith and, and, and thus an activist, you know. So depending on how that, where that person falls on that spectrum or in those four sets, kind of naive Christian, uh, progressive Christian, if you will, uh, someone who's non-Christian but kind of open and open to talking and pretty genuine, and then the oppositional non-Christian. And uh, so now I'll throw it back to you. That, that I think, di does dictate what kind of approach we take with that person. Okay. Um, let me follow up with this question. Uh, your, your sister, does she identifies as a, her lifestyle is what? She In terms of her, no. So, no, she would be, you know, it was trendy for a while and still is to say you're bi or bisexual. She at one point was calling herself that. Um, but no, she's heterosexual. She has two children, uh, no longer in a relationship with their with their father, but is by most accounts a pretty good mom. And uh, but not a not a professing Christian, so it doesn't pretend to be a progressive Christian. Nothing like that. Yeah, maybe that's what I mean. And maybe this is obvious to everyone. But um, one of the first things to note: the fact that someone has a an LGBT pride flag, and, and that itself needs some definition, doesn't necessarily mean they're involved in a homosexual lifestyle of no, any type. No, right. They, they, they might be, again, happily married to uh, someone of the opposite sex, but they feel that by, and again, that's often their display of that flag is to show their support, their sympathy, their solidarity, their something with uh, those yep. who do identify as part of that LGBT well, community. I think that's even the origination of that flag, like you talked about. I mean, a lot of that flag was used in, in other times as a source of social injustice. You know, the, the rainbow or the multicolor flag was used um, in many areas, but it wasn't until the 70s in San Francisco when that was adjusted um, to be an eight color flag. So a lot of people will say, don't even call it a rainbow flag because it's not a true rainbow. You know, it's, it's six colors. It's not seven colors of the true biblical, you know, the true biblical rainbow. And so I, I agree that I think a lot of it is, is that it's, it's a, an act of so, what they consider social justice. So if you're going to be on the, on, the, on the front lines of being a progressive social justice person, then that is a sign. Just like the Ukrainian flag or, you know, all these different things that will come out. I think just because someone hangs it doesn't necessarily mean that they're, you know, running as a, you know, professing LGBTQ or within that spectrum, uh, but simply could be, be doing that. But I would, that was an, just an interesting thing. I, if I had a chat with one of the parents here, just a little, even today, who brought up that same fact of like, it's not a rainbow flag, you know, it's a multicolored flag, it's the pride flag. And being clear as Christians also to be able to just identify the difference between that. Rainbow is, that is, that is God, that is a covenant color and the number of, you know, seven that God uses for us. Granted, now if we get into the scientific spectrum, you know, you get into, there's a lot of cross colors in there as well. But well, we'll, we'll save that for another oh, day, Brian. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think some of the irony and Brian's pointing to num number one is the rainbow. The rainbow, of course, I think in some of the Sunday school lessons today, it was the fact that the rainbow is God's covenant sign for with Noah, um, a promise to never destroy the earth again through a flood, um, and that's been kind of hijacked. And Brian, you referred to some of the, the history of that. Second thing, which to me is ironic, is the whole label pride which has an interesting biblical history. Now, there are a couple of occasions when Paul does use I am proud in a, a positive sense, but 
overall, pride is not what we want to be. Proud is not what we want to be. Humility is the virtue uh, that we want to cultivate and to uh, use that term, again, says something, you know, I think very interesting. The, the third thing, which uh, Brian kind of alluded to as well, it's, it's a social justice issue. Um, where do our ideas of social justice come from? The Bible? <laughs> I mean, in non-Christian cultures, the idea that individuals should not be discriminated against, that their, that their rights should be protected, that, you know, whatever, human rights in general is a Christian creation. In the ancient world, there was no protection of rights of people who were uh, considered outside of, of the mainstream. So it is Christianity that even brought to the table this idea that we should be concerned about injustice. And like so many things in the world, uh, twisting and perverting truth creates a new distortion and a new lie. Um, and that's why it becomes very difficult in conversations, again, to untangle the truth and show which part is true, which part is not true, and try to make that clear. Well, um, oh, there's so many directions. You know, I, I think one thing that would be helpful to remember is that... Um, Often, the, the most difficult situations are not the neighbor that you don't have a relationship with. Um, the more difficult situation when this is your daughter who lives next door to you. And she puts up a, a pride flag. Um, some of you have been spared because within your family you have this um, homogeneity of cultural views. And everybody in your family thinks the same way about things like this and, and many other topics. They all voted for the same person in 2020. They all, others of you know that's not how life is sometimes. That your children disagree with you very, very strongly about an issue like this. And you want to be able to communicate with them and explaining why, no, I'm not a bigot. I'm not a hateful person. I just don't celebrate a lifestyle which is contrary to what God has revealed in, in the Bible. And there are reasons for that. But explaining that is a little different than, you know, when it's someone who you never met before, hey, knock, knock on their door. I, I, I would say, maybe because I made up the question, I have an answer. I would just say, Whoever it is, pretty much, I notice you, you have a pride flag. I, I'm just curious why, why you have that. That would be the first thing I would want to know. What is their reason? Because I think a lot of people, they don't realize what they're saying any more than they realize what they're saying when they put a Ukrainian flag up. <laughs> they don't realize what they're saying by that pride flag. Well, I just think everybody should be treated fairly. Well, that great I, I do too but why do you have a pride flag um yeah that that's uh, you i think you um <clears throat> you've hit on the first disposition that would be required i think to have a healthy conversation is start with a question why help help me understand um and that's where I think if you know a little bit about where the person's coming from, you might have an idea that it, it really could be someone, and this is where I think the naive Christian sits. And I do believe there are naive Christians who have been co-opted by the language of social justice to think that you only appear compassionate and Christ-like if you have a BLM sign, have a pride flag up, have a trans rights or human rights slogan up, something like that. You're, you only appear compassionate if you have those things. And so some Christians naively think, well, I better grab one of those labels and symbols so I can cue to others I'm a loving, compassionate Christian. And that, that's what I call the naive Christian. And in that regard, I think you ha at least have a starting place. This person wants to appear 
to love their neighbor. And then you can begin to inquire and inform where they got the idea that this was the proper way to love their neighbor. Um, and, and I think that begins the conversation about, well, what does the Bible teach about sexuality? Uh, is it loving to affirm something that is a grievous sin? Um, how, you know, so then you get in, I think you get into some more deep theological questions. If the person is coming from a place of naivety, then you're able to say, well, can I help you understand maybe with a little more depth why I don't support BLM or the pride flag? And here are my theological, biblical reasons why. And, uh, and that might help the naive one who just wants to cue that they're loving. And they're trying to cue that to people. That's the virtue signal thing that happens now um, so readily. So that would be step one, yeah, is ask some questions and, and figure that out. Well, and I think so much... In today's culture, everything needs to be labeled or fit within certain social categories. And so I think what you're saying is, is correct, is that a lot of Christians feel that pressure to, 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 in order to show love or to conformity or to be able to not, you know, rock the boat or seem as this bigoted or hatred, you know, to try and, um, you know, soften the Christian faith world because a lot of times what's portrayed to people is very harsh and very hard and very demeaning and, and, and a lot of it is they're speaking truth but in how they're doing it they're not doing it in a way that shows love seasoned you know seasoned with salt and so I, I think there's there's areas that we just have to be careful in even on the labeling because uh, and this is maybe even just a little bit off topic, but even the idea of, you know, when someone becomes a, a Christian and has same-sex attractions, and this idea of being a gay Christian, can I be a gay Christian? And, and it's this label of, like, I still, that's my identity is this, this sexual orientation. And so I think as a church and as, as, as leadership and as Sunday school teachers and as, as parents especially, I think this is... You know, I think a lot of people will label this, even though we're, culture is trying to categorize these areas. If we don't at least think about them, talk about them, understand them, be able to relate to them, this pendulum is going to continue to, to swing very, very wildly. And in order to do that in a way that is, is loving and biblical and where we can point people to Christ in understanding that I'm a sinner... If you're in part of the LGBTQ plus IA plus whatever community, um, I'm a beggar. You're a beggar. We're, we're, but I'm a beggar pointing you to the person that has bread. You know, I'm I'm a sinner who has been saved by grace, and my desire isn't to get you from homosexual to heterosexual. My my goal is to get you to see Christ and to see the grace that is offered through Christ. And I think a lot of times this desire to have to try and do it within those niche wordings or categories can make it can make it difficult for us to figure out how do we navigate in those arenas but yet doing it in a loving way but not doing it in a way now I'm just posing more questions but not doing it in a way that just seems soft and palliative of you know it's okay you know you can so my thing with the with the with the flags is is I think you should know your neighbors. That's the first thing, like what Jared said. There's a lot of different camps. It, it might be a neighbor I've never met yet. We've lived next door for six years. <laughs> yeah. but uh, That's awesome. Right. But, you know, because a lot of times the... You know, Brit, they're not real friendly, though. I know that. Yeah. If, if your first invitation to conversation is them hanging a flag, I don't want to say shame on you, but... It's, that's unfortunate that it took that long for them to put something that opposes maybe or ruffles your feathers or, or brushes against you because we believe in the Bible, that that's your first initiative to be able to make contact with them. When really it should have been that that's a lost person there, whether they have a flag or whether they have a, a house that's got, you know, 56, you know, motorcycles in the front yard and cars stacked up to the back. I mean, there's a lot of different camps we can go in with neighbors, but have we initiated that love and that grace and that relationship before that flag ever showed up would be my challenge. I, I, I'm just thinking that this whole discussion... Um, there's a, n a number of goals, and it's good perhaps to identify for yourself. Well, what, what do I want to be able to do? What do I want to learn? What do, what do I want to work on? Um, for some people, and I think a very, very important thing is I want to help 
my children or maybe my grandchildren develop a biblical understanding of this issue because they are growing up in a culture where the norm is to accept LGBT stuff as normal and something positive. And I want to help them recognize why this is not the case. That's, a, a, that's very important. Um, secondly, some of you might, might have, you know, friends, family members who are Christians but seem somewhat oblivious or ambivalent about this type of issue. And you want to help them see that, no, this is contrary to God's word. This is contrary to what God desires. And, that, and that's a, a legitimate, again, desire as well. Some of you are a little more, whatever, bold. <laughs> and you're saying, well, I, I want to go to the people who think this way. I want to help them recognize that whether it is they're involved in the lifestyle itself or whether they're simply affirming that lifestyle, this isn't good. This is unhealthy. Now, at that point, you have put yourself in a, a whole other circle where how, how do you approach people um, who, again, have already embraced this and know why they've embraced it. Um, part of what I think you want to do, what I would want to do is I think this is wrong, and I'm not a hateful person. We haven't gained a whole lot if your neighbor or coworker thinks, yeah, well, Jared thinks that wrong, is that wrong? And that's not a surprise because he's a hateful bigot. We haven't, <laughs> we've drawn the line. <laughs> yes, we're on this side, they're on that side, and, and they all think we're hateful bigots. That hasn't helped anything as far as if our goal is to help them, as I like to quote Paul, that to, uh, if our desire is that God would grant them repentance and that they would come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who's taken them captive to do his will. If that's our desire, I have to do more than just say, well, I'm against that. I'm against that. How, how do I pro approach people um, and say, no, there, there, there's a better way. There's a better way. Um, some of the more painful conversations I've had involve people who were members of this church and were leaving the church because we were anti-LGB, at least, I don't know about T, but that, that, we, that we, basically same-sex marriage, that we spoke out against same-sex marriage, and, and they felt, well, we can't be part of that church because our son is gay, and we, we can't be here if you're going to attack our son. And I, I tried to say, no, I'm not attacking your son. <laughs> you know, this is about, um, one, this is about the definition of marriage, which is a, a whole other topic. Um, but, and it's interesting, I, you know, they at least initially bought into the whole idea, well, the Bible doesn't really condemn homosexuality. I don't know that, there aren't a lot of, that's not, although I was surprised, you know, average people up here on the Iron Range are trying to tell me that the Bible doesn't really condemn homosexuality. Uh, yes, it does. And, you know, listening to some of their Logic, again, um, maybe we can go on this one. You know, the, the logic is that, well, Paul was condemning coercive relationships, not mutually, uh, um, what's my word? Consensual. Consensual, mutual consent. Yeah. These, these are two loving men, and uh, Paul would never be, because he's, he, obviously he was in favor of love. He wrote 1 Corinthians 13. So he wouldn't be against a loving relationship. He was against, you know, abusive relationships, especially with, with you know, in, in the ancient world that was fairly common for the master, you know, to abuse, sexually abuse a, 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 a child who was a slave or something. Uh, and, you know, then, well, Jesus never mentioned homosexuality and uh, 
a number of things. The word homosexual didn't exist in any translations before, eight, before 1946. Um, then I think it was, I forget what the King James uses, but man lovers was the, 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 the phrase. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really irrelevant what, how it was translated, but it was very clear um, that Romans chapter 1 <laughs> makes it very clear that there is a natural, and Jesus made it very clear, <laughs> he created male and female. And uh, that is to be uh, the basis for um, many things. I mean, it's the basis for uh, humanity to continue because reproduction, being fruitful and multiplying, is a big part of why we're put, put on this earth. It's also the relationship which provides the encouragement and support needed because men without wives are not good things, you know. And yes, and, and people get a lot confused with that. Not every male-female relationship produces children. That's true for a variety of reasons. But that the, the reason God intended it, that most relationships would produce children. That's, the, that's part of the purpose. Um, not every, you know, many single men, single men can be wonderful people. But in general, <laughs> being married, having a wife, is very, very helpful for men to develop the character that God intends. So God has a purpose in, in male-female marriage that um, it's just very sad that so many have rejected that. But part of the reason, and part of the sadness, it's another sadness, because people have rejected because it's, we're so broken in our culture. There's so many messed up marriages. And, you know, I, I for one, I don't think people are born with a gay gene. I, I don't think that's what happens. I think people are beaten, <laughs> and not physically necessarily, but they're beaten and bruised by the fall, and out of that, they're trying to find, in their pain, they're trying to find something that gives them life. Um, I was just wondering, would you want to get into just a little bit of some of the stuff like what you've talked about, just with the you know, the, the sexual orientation and maybe some of the, just some of the, the, the history and some of the stuff with, you know, a lot of the brokenness that comes with, within yeah. people that even call themselves yeah. one, any part of that spectrum. Yeah, briefly, and actually I'll get to, I want to respond to a few things Dan said. So first he said, if you're worried about like your kids and your kids as they're getting on, ready to go off to college or something. And, and I would, yeah, so the, the first thing is at the family level, I hope you've been able to, and I understand even we fail at this, been able to model the strength and beauty of a male-female monogamous marriage so that your kids look at that and go, that was a pretty compelling view of marriage, and uh, though it wasn't perfect, I can see that that was something healthy. And that, so that's the first level, and in, in your family, hopefully there's some explicit teaching about what sexuality is and is for. Um, and then at the church level, at the youth group level, at the small group level, and, and Brian, you and I have talked about this, and that's why we've done some seminars. I hope as a church there's some discipleship explicitly about marriage, family, sexuality, so that your kids understand they're not just, it, well, that, so that it's both caught and taught. That they catch it because they see it as compelling, and, then, and they're able to see brokenness in their Friends, families, where things fall apart and just the ways people have been hurt. So it's caught and taught, and you got to do both. And um, Dan gave you kind of a cursory summary of the arguments you might get from a progressive Christian about why we really shouldn't trust the Bible as condemning homosexuality. And look, those arguments are pretty weak, and we could, I could give you plenty of references on how to defeat those, but you should have a general idea of how to defeat those that, no, in fact, it does. Um, and then the, the second part you brought up was that you, you still have an understanding that these people who are in the LGBT world for some reason, whether they're homosexual or they're claiming a trans identity in some way, um, that there's a real brokenness there. There's been a breakdown both, um, it could be even a little bit at the hormonal level where they're just a slightly feminized male or a slightly masculinized female and it's created this discomfort. Then there's some family trauma and you just add in all the things in the fall 
And then it becomes, well, yeah, I, I can see how we, some people have ended up where they are. That just allows you to be human and real about it, um, but, that, but that's not a signal for affirmation. Really, that's a signal for let, let's direct, let's get you in touch with a merciful healing Savior. Um, so we, we could go down that road, but that's another seminar, but that's kind of what you're getting. How do we teach? How do we have a church culture and a family culture that offers a compelling view of the biblical ideal of marriage? Um, and then offer grace and healing when those things have fallen apart um, rather than affirmation. And, but you also talked about the other category of person I want to just briefly refer to, and that's the person who's truly oppositional and activist in the culture against Christian sexuality. And, and I would say, first of all, one, there's a large number of those people who are not persuadable, aside from a miracle of the Holy Spirit, uh, are not interested in even, even if you were to be the most winsome, loving Christian and brought them freshly baked pie every day, they have no interest in changing their mind, partly because they just reject a worldview at all that would restrict sexuality, and they probably have adopted without really even maybe being able to articulate, but a postmodern neo-Marxist view of truth, and which has, you know, which just won't respond to rational arguments or theological arguments. So there are those people that won't respond to winsomeness or even rational theological, anthropological arguments. They're just committed all the way. The problem is when those people get on school boards or are teaching at your university, or those people do actually need to be confronted in the public square with hopefully some form of political power, and you know they won't be won over with baked pies and, and kind thoughts. So... There is a, I think there's a limit to how far the let me be winsome with you will go with some people. Yes, yeah, so, and although I, I would think the, the focus in those relationships is not so much whether um, of the morality of LGBT stuff, it is the whole question of civil discourse yep. and do I have a right to have my opinion? Or are you claiming that everyone has to have, to be an American, you have to share my opinion on LBGT stuff, yeah. and and to to say, and to recognize that this is very tends to be very totalitarian yeah. uh, views coming that boy you don't you don't deserve uh, the right to ever speak if you're going to be critical of same sex marriage, and and I think the one thing that some of the oversteps that have been made now by the transgender movement are creating enough of a backlash in the public square where I, I think you, you should be comfortable showing up at a school board meeting and saying, I sure hope we're not letting boys in the girls' locker rooms. Um, I, I sure hope we've got some rules around, um, you know, bathroom use or show up at your local town hockey meeting and say, what are we going to do the first time a bantam boy wants to play on the 15U girls hockey team. And what are you going to do, coach? Uh, yeah, well. What did you decide? Hibbing Chisholm doesn't have a 15U girls hockey team, so that's the high school problem. But, um, you know, when, when someone who's gone through male puberty wants to compete against girls, I, I have daughters who are female athletes, you know, and I've thought about those. those that isn't going to be won over through rationality or winsomeness. You just have to be able to show up. And, and show a little bit of toughness in the public square to fight for what's right. And that is happening a little bit. I think there's been some obvious oversteps in the transgender movement that are causing enough of the public to say, yeah, maybe we should pull back on some of that. And, and you're reflecting the fact that there's a little bit of difference between L, G, B, and the T's. And uh, so uh, the, the, the whole transgender issues are, again, most, I, I think for many, many people, many people, the idea that, hey, whatever two adults want to do in the privacy of, of their own home, I don't care. I don't want people telling me what I can do. I don't want to try to tell someone else what they can do. And so for, for them, that because, so therefore I affirm LGB rights. Transgender takes it into a whole other category, especially with minors be, you know, being treated, having surgeries, getting hormonal uh, treatments that are a lot of times 
if not irreversible, at least very damaging. And I think uh, Vice President Pence um, probably sums up for a lot of people, if adults want to transition from male to female, that's up to them. But minors, children, teenagers, that's, that's, uh, that's an evil assault uh, where um, people's, people's rights are being violated by that, and, and it's abusive. Um, again, I, I haven't talked to the vice president this week, but I don't think he believes it's a good thing that adults would transition from male to female or, or vice versa, but he's saying that's not a government concern. And Yeah, I think the counter argument to that, are there any doctors or nurses in here? I'm sure there's probably a few. The, the counter to that would be, should the medical field be allowed to, regardless of the age of the patient, be allowed to do physical damage to healthy bodies for psychological conditions? That would be the argument against it, even for adults, to say, why would we have a medical field that thinks that's okay? Um, and then the LGBTs have a whole nother than with the Qs, which whatever Q represents, if it's questioning, I am not quite sure what that is, but, but when Q represents queer and queer theory, that's, a whole, that's not about lifestyle choices people are making. Queer theory essentially, here's my two cents summary, queer theory is based on the idea that heteronormalcy, that saying heterosexual relationships are, are normal, that that's the whole problem with our culture. And anything, anything that goes against that is good. That's the neo-Marxism rooted, so queer theory would be rooted in critical theory, neo-Marxism, yeah, yeah, which is that any, anything normative that, you know, reeks of order and logic is bad. Yeah. Bad and oppressive. <laughs> and oppressive, yeah. We have to be free from any rules where, you know, I, I mean, many people, LGBs, they have rules for their relationship. I mean, um, it's interesting, you know, the, the uh, sexual anarchy that exists, there's still, whatever, 90, almost 90% 90 of people who believe adultery is wrong. Homosexuals believe adultery is wrong. If their relationships, they don't want the same-sex partner they're with to be cheating on them. That would be wrong. Um, but from queer theory, of course, there is no such thing as wrong. It's, it's, um, it's all good. If, if, it, if it breaks the rules, it must be good. Again, everything is how John Piper talks about that we're desire factories. It is all rooted in our desires and because of the fall, because of a, a heart that is wayward and for many people where, where truth has been veiled from them, their desires are going to lead to sin and that is that direction and anything that hampers my ability to accomplish my desires is then seen as discrimination or you are you're somehow limiting my ability to experience happiness or what I define as, as happiness and so automatically as a Christian you are categorized in a box or you are trying to take away someone's happiness well how dare you take someone else's someone else's happiness and I think again when we talk about as a church how we how we deal with this you know because i think even in our area up in you know northern minnesota they talk about you know the, are you born with this gene and then of course you can bring in the logic of well then why is it regional why is it in these bigger cities that the the population of the lgbt community is so much higher than a a small town in ohio if it's a genetic thing versus a cultural dynamic that's happening um, but i also hear it on the other side of things of where people are like well i'm sure glad that i live here on the iron range i'm glad i live in northern minnesota where we don't have to deal with all that stuff and they just there's a lot of people that just kind of write it off as something that well, they deal with that in the cities. They deal with that in Seattle. They deal with that in wherever other big hotspot city may be where there's a lot of uh, these progressive movements in that area. 
Um, but statistically, I think when you look at the, I mean, it's an easy statistic to remember. It's essentially doubled every generation. So when you go from Gen X, which would be like my parents, even though I always considered myself a Gen Xer, but I guess in those late seventies, it cut to the, 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 um, millennials. Your parents are boomers. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, I, I don't know, whatever that is, but, but with each one, it doubled it was from like the, you know, like the 2% to, to 4%, the millennials, when you get up to the Gen Z's is where you're getting up to close to 20% now, um, are not necessarily practicing homosexuals, but they are, they have a, they have a favor, favorable outlook towards that community. And so, uh, one of the conferences, we were just at a Stand to Reason, one of Greg Kokel's conferences, and in one of the workshops, they talked about the idea of, of one of the things that they're dealing with now is actually the, the, the Gen Zs or the, the, the young uh, teens that are going through this now are actually converting their parents. So how are we, just like this, how are we equipping parents to be able to deal with their kids? Because like you said, the majority of Christians that are going to step away or step into the camp of being, yeah, I'm okay with this LG, are going to be the ones because one of their kids is having homosexual tendencies or one of their, one of their kids is, is, is really on fire for being able to protect you know, the rights of these individuals. And because we love our kids and we don't want to lose that relationship with kids, so many parents that would normally be, this is the line, no way, this is something I'm against, are now showing favorable opinions to that because they love their kids. And the problem is, is that love relationship, that we have to realize that Christ comes first, and that's a hard reality. I'm saying that as a, as a, as a father, but when faced with that, that's a trial that I'm going to have to work through because that's a test of, I love Christ first, and I love what God has given me in his word first more than I love my kids. Now, that doesn't mean that I just write them off and, sh you know, ship them down the river, but, but we still, as parents, have to be willing to at least be thinking about, like, I'm going to have to have this conversation with my kids because it's in our youth groups now. It's at Chisholm Baptist now. This is not something that is just in the metro areas. This is in Chisholm. This is in Cook. This is, uh, I was just listening to some teenagers talking about other kids that, well, I'm by today. I don't know. I broke up with my boyfriend. Now I'm going to, you know, because even when you look into those statistics of the categories, people that are favorable even for the LGBTQ community, I want to say it's like, so say, I think it was like 2% uh, identify as gay and then like 7 or 8% of that number are in the by area. Why? Well, because it's easy. You don't have to commit to anything. You can have a desire factory that goes in any which direction that you want, and you can affirm yourself in whatever direction you want. And so that's what kids are faced with now. If I'm not happy, I break up with John. Oh, she's really nice. We click. We hit off really well. I desire to be seen, to be heard, to be understood, to be loved, to have someone want to hold my hand or, 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 or have any displays of affection that makes me feel good. And then our desires lead to sin, and then we, and in our culture, we just keep affirming that, keep affirming that, because that's all they hear. And I'm telling you right now on social media, it's not about flags on houses, it's about flags on your Facebook profile, and for the younger guys, it's not. It's on Instagram and TikTok or their Snapchat account. It's, that's where the flags and stuff are going to be found, is on the, on the social media side. And I don't recommend engaging with these topics on social media. I just, these are, these are so much in-person so much gets lost in translation, and I've seen, I've seen relationships even within the church ruined because of arguments over social media, over some of these topics that really should have been done face-to-face -face and in person, where you can see that person. They can see you and know that I love you as a person. We're on different camps here, but I want to be able to, like James says, I want to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And I want to, let's flesh some of this out and bring it back to Scripture. One of the things that you alluded to, Brian, and I think it's worth to say a little more about, is the whole question of a parent with a child, um, who's not a child, with a son or daughter who's identifying um, as LGBT of, of some type. Um, I don't think this is rocket science. This is a call for love, but not affirmation, um, which... I say pretty much every parent knows that that's possible. You can love your child and still express disapproval of what the child is doing. 
and that still goes when they become adults. You can love them and still say, that's, that's not a good choice you're making. And, you know, one of the phrases in, in the whole conversation is love and affirm, love and affirm, love and affirm. We've tied those two together where they should not be together at all. Because sometimes love means not to affirm. Sometimes love means I point out that this is an unhealthy choice. It is a destructive choice. It is a dishonoring to God choice. Not because I don't love you, but because I do love you. And yet, unfortunately, I've seen a number of cases where someone, uh, their son or daughter, identifies as LGBT, and that person, that parent, changes their, their view. They, they used to be, you know, following the biblical understanding, but, well, I guess my, my daughter's saying that she's this, and I, I can't be following this idea that says that that's wrong because this is my, this is my child, and I have to be loyal to her. Um, on the other hand, I see lots of um, cases where, okay, son, daughter, says they're LGBT. Okay, well, it's been five years since we talked to our daughter. It's been six years since we've seen our son. The relationship is done, which is not what God would desire. Um, I, we sh I, I, I have friends who have a, a very active LGB, oh, LGB, he's, he's, he's gay, he's not an LGB. He's, he's a gay son, gay lifestyle. Initially, there was a lot of tension but now they've fig figured out a way to say, hey, Ryan, no matter, oops, no matter what happens, they, they don't live here, okay? You don't, we'll edit that out. Well, you, you don't know. <laughs> no matter what happens, don't ever think that we don't love you. We will always love you. We will care about you. We will always do that. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, <laughs> we're going to continue to love you. And at the same time, don't ever think that we approve of this choice you're making. No matter, no matter what we do, no matter what we say, don't, don't ever take that as approval because we don't approve it. We, 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 we know it's wrong according to God's word, and that's where we stand. But again, that doesn't mean we don't love you. That doesn't mean we don't care about you. And, and somehow, and, and for them it's worked really well. They've done a really good job on that. And again, their prayer is still that their son will come to his senses and that God will grant repentance and they, that he's escaped from this trap of the devil, but they're willing to, <laughs> they're in it for the long haul. They, 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 they are willing to stick beside him and uh, pray that God would work in his life. So um, it doesn't work as well for everybody in that. The, the, the tensions can be greater, but yeah, you can't change your, theology or your understanding of the Bible based on choices your son or daughter are, are make, is, is making. And um, yeah, you, you, you don't want to forfeit that relationship. Um, I'll piggyback off that. I, and I think it's not just Gen Zs and younger who have this tendency to like almost threaten to end the relationship if they're not fully affirmed or agreed with. It actually started with millennials, I think. Millennials willing, and this is where the OK Boomer thing came in. Millennials willing to dismiss and just ignore their boomer parents because they're so old and fuddy-duddy and don't get it. And, and we saw some of this in some of our own family dynamics, not my immediate family, but some other relatives. And so and that, would be, that would be an encouragement to any of you who are kind of millennial and younger, born in the 80s, 90s, and beyond. Don't cut off parents and grandparents because you think they're so stuck in the mud. That, don't. Don't be so arrogant and naive to think you've got it and there's no wisdom from them. I've seen the hurt it's caused the generation above me my, in my, at my parents' level and their peers. Um, so that's what I mean. But, that, but then, so then you get the parents here of Gen Zs and Gen Ys who are so afraid, so afraid to offend their kids and want to be seen as so cool that they'll slap up a, a BLM sign or a, because they don't want to be written off. And so you're right. You, as a parent, can't live in fear that your child or this person you love could sever the relationship because 
you refuse to agree with them. That is a risk you're taking, but, but that's not your main loyalty. Um, but I would encourage, especially any young people in here who profess faith in Christ, do not threaten to end a relationship because of a disagreement over politics or theology or something like that. That's so hurtful and a, and a brutal way to wield the weapon of whatever argument you're having. Um, but I, I, and I would say to my, so my older sister, it's been the better part of two decades where she's been very oppositional to Christianity, walked away from her faith and, um, you know, and then has been a promoter of all things progressive and all that. My parents have never, ever not loved her. She's never not known where my parents or any of us siblings stand with regards to our faith and our and really our politics either. And, and to her credit, she never really threatened to cut off the relationship. She's always maintained kind of a healthy interaction with our family in spite of some very significant differences. Um, so that, that's possible too. And I, we also, have, on my wife's side, have a cousin who would be out as gay and has already had one failed homosexual marriage. And, um, and I think his parents have done their best to do the same, to love him, uh, invite him to family things, you know, keep that olive branch extended, um, but never waver on their commitment to biblical truth about sexuality. And so, you know, it, it can be done. It, it's not easy. No. I, I mean, no. I, I think I have two cousins who one is a gay, one is lesbian. And um, I mean, I have like 20 some cousins on this side. It's, so it's not like we had real close relationships, but you know, they were people who I knew. And when they identified as homosexual, it was just easier not to talk to them. I mean, easier for me. I didn't, I didn't have to, you know, deal with that. And that really is not, <laughs> that's not a terribly courageous or biblical response. Um, uh, there should have been conversation. I mean, and I probably should do it now. Well, okay, 15 years later, I'm going to get around and, and saying something. But um, uh, yeah, I think, you know, w w and, and maybe this is a lesson. Don't postpone conversations just assuming it'll get better. Because um, <laughs> it may, you know, there's, it, if, it's start, if it's starting to go in the wrong direction, the wrong direction will probably continue. So you want to have those conversations with, especially with younger people, but with older people too. Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Again, start with the why question. Why, why are you doing this? Why is this something that's important to you right now? Why? Um, get that understanding. Seek to respond in a clear, courageous, compassionate, and compelling way that um, this is not a good path. You need to turn around. And I think, uh, I just think too, as, as, a, as a church and as a, as a body of believers, um, when we look into, uh, Jared, you had mentioned earlier, alluded to the idea of, you know, um, you know clinicians or, or, or people in the medical profession doing physical alterations to body, which was really, a, which was, Clearly, a, a mental condition that needs to be to be treated. Um, but as a church, how are we responding to these individuals? That when you look statistically um, of that LGBTQ plus community, one of the you know the depression and anxiety and all of these types of um, factors on the mental scale are incredibly high in that area. And, and there's a lot of loneliness. There's a lot of um, even self-shame and things that a lot of these, especially the younger teenagers and stuff that are dealing with this. Uh, do we have a community that at least outwardly presents a, a, an, an openness and a lovingness? And again, that's that love versus affirmation that we can identify that what we believe is wrong but we love you as a person. We want to see you in church. We want to see you in youth group. This isn't anti, you know, we, oh my, we, we better draft policies because what if we get, I hope we get some individuals that are having some deep-rooted struggles that we have an opportunity to be able to try and show the love of Christ, the, the one thing in this world that is going to give them joy and is going to give them peace and 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 maybe you can even just talk about 
you know, within youth group, you deal with individuals. Um, and like I said, it's in the churches right now that we deal with. And do you have any? And are they, you know, how long do they stick around or how long? Because I've found that, uh, that many will stick around until they kind of get to a point where they where they where they're wrestling with this, but the, the the problem is it seems like that deep seated desire has that sinful desire is is just too hard of a stronghold for them to be able to give up. And so while they love being a part of the let's we'll just say the youth group, while they love being a part of the youth group and enjoy the camaraderie and we have discussions and we talk about these things, but they can never find a way to get around this of like, how can I be a Christian but still embrace this lifestyle is I've seen where we have seen that kind of relationship kind of fade away. And for me, even like you said, you could pursue or you could talk, unfortunately, till you're blue in the face, but at, there's certain points where they will just kind of press you to the side. Yeah, that's definitely, that is definitely true that I'd say for the majority of them, unless they're really integrated into the church fully, and that's the problem with sometimes at youth group, you get kids who come in, and it's great. You want a youth group where kids can come in from the fringes and be loved and find the youth group to be a fun place. But if they're not really well integrated and you don't have a deep relationship with them, then it is easy for them to just leave as soon as they hear something that doesn't, they don't like. And that, so we've had several cases like that. Um, I, I got to be careful about details because some would still be around. Where I, w- I think they've really wrestled with questions regarding sexuality, and yet they're very, very sincere in their faith. Um, they they he- come to our youth groups when we're talking about sexuality, and we do it every year for about five weeks. They listen intently. Um, they may ask some important questions, and I think I think those are the ones where. If at one point they ever just came out, you know, a lot of these kids aren't going to just come out to their youth pastor. You, you would want to have the relationship and, and probably know, hopefully know their parents well enough too to say, you know, given that you're dealing with this, are you willing to help us figure out how you can navigate this in a way that honors Christ? Um, and, and, you know, there is a path forward in the Christian faith for someone who, and you use the term and it's the right term, same-sex attracted or gender dysphoric. There is a path forward for them. Um, you know, so you'd want to ask, is, it, is this something you want us to walk with you as you figure out how to honor Christ without succumbing to this, you know, lifestyle or whatever? And, and there's all kinds of good Christian resources, too, that, help, that can help a kid see a, a future where they don't have to leave the church and live in shame or totally embrace that lifestyle or whatever. So I think it it's hard to find that kid who's integrated enough with their leaders and with their family to really use the church as a place where they could heal and grow through that. But I, I do, I, I suspect they're there, and a church that's doing it well will get to have those conversations. Yeah. How a church or an organization deals with those are, are important questions. Um, and... Some deal with it better than others. <laughs> um, I think Bethel University has struggled um, because officially it supports traditional marriage, traditional values, and yet on that campus there's many LGBT activists and they have a, a, a group that is sanctioned and by the university itself. And of course this, when was it in the last spring? Um, when the bill was passed that as far as being a kind of a transgender refuge the state of Minnesota it was introduced by the only trans member of the state legislature who happens to be a graduate of Bethel University and um, she no longer identifies as Christian but she would like to come to churches and speak and explain how churches can be more supportive of, of the LGBTQ community um, uh, there's been some discussion of, of, of Saddleback and uh, uh, Rick Warren's church, which has a apparently um, groups, support groups for parents of, of uh, children who identify as LGBT. And um, 
still a little unclear what exactly happened to those groups. I could think that, that would be a wonderful group to have to help parents deal with that from a biblical perspective, but apparently uh, the groups were becoming affirming rather than simply welcoming. I, again, those are the easy words to use. We want to be a church which welcomes everybody, no matter what sin they're involved with. You're, you're welcome here. Now, yeah, there are some restrictions as far as people criminally, you know, can't be. But in general, everybody's welcome. But we do not affirm. We do not tell you that this is okay. We say this is sin. This is a sinful lifestyle. This is something God wants you to repent of. Um, and that's the balance we have to have. Welcoming, but not affirming. Welcoming, but not affirming. And uh, any church, like one I drove by today, which puts up a pride flag with a cross in the middle on its building is welcoming, yes, but it's also affirming um, sinful lifestyles. And I, this doesn't really fit in, but I, I think, I, I don't think there's any, I don't, for people who are struggling, for non-believers who are embracing, I don't know that anger is really the proper response. I mean, anything a non-Christian does, uh, you know, it has to be kept in mind that they're, yeah, they've been taken captive by the evil one, and freedom from the evil one is what will bring freedom from these other things. But the one group of people which it's difficult not to be angry about involve pastors and theologians who profess to be believers in Christ, but are advocating um, not, not just advocating, uh, you know, support for LGBT. What they are doing is condemning, condemning those within the church who are holding to biblical standards. And um, I just think it is very, very, very evil. Um, well, especially like when you said... It, it's one thing for adults, but also you had mentioned, you know, what people that get on school boards. I think a lot of times when it comes to children, when it comes to, I mean, as a, the, the church history shows itself as being one of being an advocate for the widows and for the children and for being able to stand up for, for the unborn, those who do not have a right, who do not have an ability to speak. And I think as Christians, that's where we do need to step forward as adults who love kids if there are opportunities that we need to be able to say, no, this is wrong, that, that our children are being taught this, or, or how are we going to deal with this in a way ahead of time rather than retrospectively when it's usually a big mess typically after the fact, but you know, whether it's as a church or within our communities or whatever else, I think that that's a, an arena for us as, an, you know, as adults to be able to speak for these kids. I, when you get into the, the transgender stuff, that's, I mean, it's, it's incredibly, it's, it's scary. It, it really is scary what they're doing and allowing kids to make decisions about, and, and as the state of Minnesota kind of swings in this direction, it becomes even scarier when, when, when there's legislation that comes out that says that kids can have procedure, I mean, maybe not medical procedures, but they can have things done or where they can talk to counselors, and those counselors can't even tell the parents that their kids are wrestling with this, that, you know, your kid goes to school, they tell the counselor, like, I've been having some issues with, and, and the new legislation says they can't tell the parents there's, there's, there's confidentiality within there, and so now you're allowing kids that, whose brains aren't fully functioned, and I'm one of those kids of every kid that my brain I think your brain's still, still is, not it's still not fully formed um, being able to make decisions that are going to drastically affect the rest of their lives and, and your statement Brian I th I just had this discussion I agree that there are some individuals who are advocating that because they have a very very um, evil intent. But a lot of individuals who are advocating that just think it's, it's the kind thing to do. It's the loving thing to do. How can you be against that? Um, and so I have to remember in conversations, is this a person who's doing this because they understand the ramifications and think this is what we want to do? Or is it this whole mass of people who just, 
the, the words love, affirmation just seem to be what's on their mind and they do that. I, I do need to say something about, um, since I made some negative comments about our alma mater, Bethel University, where Brian, you went there a long time, yeah. And anyway, oh, like uh, I failing, failing out? Failing? No, I didn't. <laughs> No, no, undergrad. Anyway, but I, I think um, it is significant and wonderful to point out that our denomination, Converge, the denomination formerly known as the Baptist General Conference, has came out with two years ago excellent statements on marriage in favor of male female marriage and humanity. We are born, God determine that we are male or female. There is no, there is no <laughs> non-binary is not part of the, of the equation. So our denomination did that on a national level. Our uh, district, on which Jared serves as the on the board, is in the process of adopting that for the states of Minnesota and Iowa. And uh, a few months ago, we as a congregation adopted those statements as part of our uh, belief as a church that we uh, believe in uh, marriages between a man and a woman and uh, human beings are male or female. And you can't identify what, what, you, what you are <laughs> in your sex. You can't identify differently in your gender. Sex and gender really are the same thing. Um, we got 10 minutes. Give me, we'll switch microphones. I will go out into the, the mob and see what uh, they have to say. So, um, okay, now I could, boy, with the lights on me, I, I don't even know who's here. Um, if you have a question, we need to put it in the microphone for it to be, or a statement, whatever. Um, All right, then we better come down. Kim? I guess I have more of a comment. So I'm newer to northern Minnesota of weeks. I, you used to live in northern I Minnesota. I used to live in northern Minnesota a long time ago, but moved to the Twin Cities, have worked in the Twin Cities. Um, so it is here. I work in one of your local organizations. Um, I think just one of my comments is working in mental health, um, Vanderbilt University came out with a study last year, but it was actually done pre-COVID, but they finally got it published, that 73% of LGBTQ plus um, identified as having some type of trauma from their childhood. And I know in working in child and adolescent that it is one of the reasons for youth suicide between 13 to 17. Um, and I think the thing that surprised me about the study was that it was not physical abuse or sexual abuse, it was emotional abuse being the most impacting in the Vanderbilt study. So as a church and as an individual, I kind of look at, you know, the woman that was getting the stones cast upon her. We all have sin, and, you know, Christ has died for us on the cross just as he has for everyone and the opportunity to be there for someone. Um, but how as a church, you know, do we look at abuse and do we look at other th opportunities that are in our community? And that's been the one surprise to me moving here is... Um, the hurt in this community is so great. And I'm glad to be here. Um, but, it, you know, so it's not so much a question, I guess it's just a pondering of when we're working with our youth, how do we make sure that they feel loved and that they feel that they're not in situations of emotional abuse? I know uh, one of the things that I had... Um I think as a church, when we've started the biblical counseling has been a big aspect. And so going through the first 
block of that. Um, and then also working through some of the material that they have there out to be able to help parents and to be able to help even you know youth programs to interact with and how do we deal with with students that are questioning or, or unsure or, or, or have these types of things is really important and I think our area needs more people that are trained and and take time to take a vested interest in and in how do we kind of be on the offensive with this and not offensive and offensively but in a loving manner um, you know just simple things as far as the languages that we can use especially with with teens and kids can be incredibly um, important in how you're engaging with them you know for example like you have a student that uh, you know and your first response is as well that you know that that's a choice you know that that, that you have a, a sexual attraction towards another male is a choice that you have well that individual may be wrestling with that that original sin that's in their life that they they whether whether it's through an, an emotional trauma that they're not even really aware of or something that they went through but there's people that will that will enter that LGBTQ arena and be full steam ahead. This is what I want to do. This is the choice, the direction I want to go. But we also have to remember there's other people that are in that spectrum or in that community that are really wrestling with that, that are dealing with a lot of guilt and shame. And if they had the choice, they would remove that temptation from their lives. They, they really want nothing to do with it, but it's there and it's real. And you talk about loneliness and depression and feeling suicide and, and the stuff that they're going through, we, we, we do need to be careful in how we engage because, again, I think love and grace will, will supersede all of those things of, well, let me give you a, a three-step program. And again, I think if we can keep that proper context between love and affirmation, um, is, is an important cue, but we do. These, there's, so much, there's so much hurt out there, so thank you for that. Yeah, and I, and I think it just gets back to you do have to have, as you said, a, you should have a youth group, you should have youth leaders, you should have a church where hurt people can feel love, they're taught the love of God, they're taught the mercy of Christ. Um, and your youth group, you, it's not like you only talk about sexuality at youth group. You, you know, our youth group, we talk about all sorts of things that would relate to our hurts and, and the grace of God and Christ's forgiveness and and places and ways you can heal, and, and then we spend a significant time on sexuality. So there just should be enough of an atmosphere of uh, children feeling safe in your youth ministries and that God can care for and, and handle whatever they bring him. Um, and then, you know, and then they can, when, when the sexuality discussion hits, it can land in a place where they're open to, open to it and don't feel like it's just a place where they get beat up. Thank you. And th Kim, thank you. I mean, we're very fortunate that you are here in our community and um, providing help from a Christian perspective, a professional Christian perspective. Thank you. Um, Nova, you wanted to ask a question or say something? Yeah. Um, well, a couple things, you know. Now, I went to Augsburg, and their views on this subject are totally different than what they would be at Bethel. And if I would have known the difference or how important it was, I would have gone to Bethel instead. All right. Um, Hopefully they're different at Bethel. Yeah, well, sure they are. And, you know, and I've experienced, and, and, you know, if I would have known this was a subject tonight, because I've had other things going on in my life that have made me forget that it's Pride Month. But... If, if I would have known this was the subject, I probably would have stayed home because I've had to deal with it so much in my life. But um, there, there is the biblical uh, verse that says, man should not lie with a man as with a woman, and woman should not lie with a woman as with a man. And it doesn't get any more black and white. But a couple verses down, it says, well, God's not going to, stick his nose in and deny people's wills and everything. And so it's our responsibility to be able to judge either way. That's kind of my view of it. But it's been, it's been such, it's had such an effect on our society, on the world. And, and uh, you know, sometimes it gets to the point where you just got to muddle through. But I'd like 
you know, Dan, Dan and I have conversed many times about this subject. And so, so I leave it to which way to go on this. I, I think that that's, it does bring to mind an important point. Number one, yes, there are people who question what the Bible says. Well, what does the Bible really say about homosexuality, etc.? And we need to have those discussions if someone wonders, well, what is the biblical view? However, for most people, it isn't a question what, they know what the, the Bible says. They just don't like it. And so we need to talk, yes, we agree we agree that these behaviors are wrong. These behaviors are sinful. The question is then, what do we do? What do we do about it? How, how do we represent Christ as his ambassadors living in a world which now, for the, in many ways, affirms these sinful choices and lifestyles? And um, being against it isn't really a strategy. We, we have to think, what, what are we going to do? How are we going to speak? How are we going to represent Christ in the best way? And, and it'll vary from person to person. I mean, Kim's on the ground floor. She's dealing with kids who, they don't know what they are, but, but, they're, but they're messed up. They, they're messed up, and she has a chance to bring wholeness to their lives, to help them find some wholeness, which ultimately will be with Christ. Um, Others of you, again, are, you're, you're in different, different situations, but we all, I guess I, that would be my challenge. All of us think, how, we, we understand what the Bible says. How can we take this message and bring it as Jesus' ambassadors to a world which is very confused right now? Mr. Smaltz. Uh, I, I just have a question, you know, as far as if you guys have any advice, um, you know, for the families, parents especially, you know, so we've got, uh, we're transitioning from private school to public school. Transitioning, yes, we're going to use, uh, use one of the keywords here, you know, one of the, so, um, but, uh, so, so we've got, got going to be having a, a fourth and fifth grader. And I uh, mean, so we're, we're, there's just a lot of concern and we've been, we've been talking with our kids about this stuff. Um, and, uh, but just pressure from classmates within the school and also possibly, you know, we, we don't know, we're not there yet, um, as far as even, you know, an openness, you know, within the school, you know, from, from teachers, you know, s stuff like that. So Where are they going to Lincoln, Hibbing, um, yep. So um, just, just some questions as far as, you know, do you have any advice, like what kind of, how in depth, what kind of conversation should we, should we be having, mm -hmm. you know, as far as encouraging them. And there's going to be, you know, we know that they're going to be shouldering, you know, more than that they have been. Um, and uh, there's going to be pressure. So, Good question. The, uh, so your two kids, fourth and fifth grade, you said? Yeah, so they're right, they're pre-adolescent, so they're right on the, Right on the edge of when kids begin to shift from uh, taking most of their cues from their parents to taking most of their cues from their peers. Um, that's, that, that's one of the definitions of adolescence. And um, so you, just given that reality, one of the goals is to keep an eye on their peers, who are their close friends, who, whose opinion do they care about in their peer group. That all lends itself to the the, the power of a strong youth group or part of a strong church where they feel like their best friends are the ones who are trying to follow Jesus too. So that's a big deal when they hit that fifth, sixth, seventh grade year. Um, that will help. The other most obvious and practical and probably most difficult is uh, I don't care if you homeschool your kids and keep them tied up at the, inside the house. If they have a phone, they have access to every Thing they could possibly want to learn, hear, see. So you need to be very proactive about what the expectations are if and when they get a phone, how it's used, what they have access to. That, you know, so, and Brian talked about this. Everyone's got hurt. Everyone's got anxiety. This is all marks of this, the youth adolescence stuff. And everyone's looking to have that assuaged in some way. And the social media at every level has built ways to keep kids captivated, 
to keep their anxiety up, to keep seeking social media as a way to pacify it momentarily. Um, so th- those are two real practical ones. And then um, the th- you said, so what, what do you talk about then? Stan and Brenna Jones have a great series of books called How and When to Tell Your Kids About Sex. It has each age group kind of broken down what's appropriate. Um, the, my biggest advice would be, you know, you can be explicit about what they shouldn't be doing and what sexuality is not for, but mostly you just want to talk about God's design for a mom and a dad and a life together building a family. I mean, that's the most simple you can be. And then as they grow through the stages, you begin to talk more about what that is and why. But And then uh, we have actually, I brought some of the resources here with us. So through our the uh, Biblical Counseling Center now, we have um, a lot of small little pamphlet materials. And this was written by Tim Geiger, who's actually the president of Harvest Ministries or Harvest USA. Uh, and he was actually an individual who struggled for many years with same-sex attraction um, and has since overcome that and has written several books of, uh, you know, explaining LGBTQ plus identity to your child. And there's some great um, kind of one-on-one things of basically talking about, well, what do you talk about with your kids when you have, uh, you know, a, a, a gay couple that are living three houses down? Um, simple things that you can talk about, like, but explaining it, because, I mean, to a certain degree, you know, we always tend to shy away from a lot of these hot topic items, myself included. These aren't always easy topics to talk, to talk about, but to be able to say, you know what, yeah, that, that's like two daddies living together, but God's design, and always bringing it back to God, what is God's definition of this? This isn't me, dad, telling you that you shouldn't do X, Y, and Z, but what is God's definition of manhood, and what is God's definition of womanhood? But I also think another thing, too, that really struck me over the years is also, we, I mean, there's an attack on masculinity and there's an attack on femininity, but also at the same time, I think we also have to be careful that we don't always just say, like, if you are a man, you look and act just like this. Not all guys have six packs, play football, and, and are into sports. There's some guys that are really musical or are really into arts and things like that. There are some girls that are, especially when they get into some of those preteen years where they can beat the guys and they want to go out and, 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 and be rough and tough and play ball and stuff like that. And I, and I think kids also need to know that, that just because you have a biblical perspective on, on biblical manhood and womanhood, it doesn't mean that you can't see or, or, or experience another guy that maybe doesn't look the same as you and that doesn't automatically put them into a category of a certain type of a person. Anyways, I got off the side, but there's, he's got several books in here, uh, you know, what to say to your child when my child says I'm gay, um, helping students with same-sex attraction, and so what we're, as a church, we're trying to build up some of these just little, they're real easy reads, they're like 80 pages, a lot of scripture also incorporated into them, just, those are just a real simple, basic tool that we can get to you right away. Um, you know, to be able to help you with that. Okay. Um, when it's all been said and done, there'll be nothing. There'll be nothing left to say or do. Uh, what time do you have to get to Menards? Bro? It closes at eight. <laughs> closes at eight. I don't know. Okay. Um, cu- couple things to mention. Uh, Russell's question. It. And I'd rather do this one to one. If if your child is in a public school, um, be aware of people on the school board and on the faculty who share your concerns and are being trying to be vigilant, making sure that these agendas are not being pushed. And I think in, in our school districts around here, yeah, there's people who are kind of trying to push those, those agendas, and there are people who are standing very solidly against that so connect with those people and um you know they need support and encouragement too that they're hey there are parents who really <laughs> want to make sure uh those things are don't come into um what our children are learning um number two many of you uh heard this morning on uh july the 10th um two weeks from tomorrow night um we're going to start a monday night study my Iron Sharpeners group are all on vacation. They're going to get dull over the summer, but um, uh, during that time slot, actually, we're going to, at 7 o'clock, we're going to do a, a study, a awakening from wokeism. 
Uh, LGBT issues is just one dimension of wokeism. Uh, you also have critical race theory and a lot of other things involved in that. And uh, I'm not really sure where the, the, this, that study is going to lead us, but we're hopefully going to pre present two things. Yes, what is the biblical perspective on some of these issues? And number two, how do we as Christ's ambassadors be advocates for that position, whether we're talking to our children, our grandchildren, the next door neighbor, or, or whoever. Um, so that, that's an opportunity. If you thought, boy, this, I, just, I just need to learn more, I need to learn more, uh, that will be one opportunity on Monday evenings, um, starting on the, night, the 10th of July. Um, Brian is uh, a great resource. Um, uh, Brittany's going to have a baby, but eventually she'll be back in action. And as uh, our, our biblical counselors are great resources. Terry, you're, Terry, you're ready to talk to people about this. You bet you are, yeah. Um, Terry would be a great person to talk to. Uh, and she comes from the perspective of both the uh, St. Louis County Social Services and all the troubled people that, that she's involved with, and as well as her study through biblical counseling. How, how do we bring that together, bring the truth of Scripture to these very difficult situations? Uh, so we have a lot of people, if, if, if you thought, I just need someone to talk to who has more experience in this, uh, we have a number of people who are, are glad to do that. And if it's really a tough question, we'll call up the cook and see if, uh, if Pastor Jared is available. But... Um, Thank you for coming, and uh, yeah, we're, this, is, this is important stuff because, uh, like it or not, most of us didn't volunteer to live in a world where, um, yeah, not only do we have same-sex marriage, but the surveys say that most people think that's a good thing, and then all of a sudden we, we thought, okay, well, we'll deal with that, and then all of a sudden we have this new thing that transgender that you can identify uh, you can be male in your, a, a man in your body, but you can identify as female. Isn't that, a, that, well, that was quite a discovery. <laughs> wow, that seems pretty amazing that that would happen. But that's what, where we're at, and it does require that um, Christians, that the church speaks the truth. Again, as I said, <laughs> clearly, courageously, compassionately, in a compelling way, and um, we're going to have to keep working on that. So, I mean, the, the evil one is always coming up with strategies. Most of them are recycled, <laughs> you know, but he's got some new twists in, in, in these, and we have to be uh, prepared and uh, prayerfully pondering how we can uh, be ambassadors for Christ. So, um, let me just close in prayer, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you, Father. Uh, continue to give us understanding. And Lord, I think especially for the people in this room who have uh, someone close to them who is being held captive by the evil one in, in some way or other. And I just pray that you would work in their lives and give uh, those who are close to them uh, both the attitudes and the words that will help them, that you might use for them to, again, come to their senses and escape, escape from that trap of the evil one. Um, thank you for Jared and Brian and their faithful uh, service to, especially to youth, and uh, their faithful service to you and desiring that the Word of God would, again, guide us as we make these decisions. Um, give us a good night. In Jesus' name, amen.